Well, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, really appreciate you guys having me out. Um, here to basically talk about something that uh, I think many of you might be thinking, well, right, we're getting towards the end of summer. Why are we talking about heat stress? Well, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of working environments, much like yours, where even indoors, working around burners, incinerators, boilers, that uh, heat is an ever-present hazard. And like anything in the world of safety, we're trying to avoid, eliminate, and try to organize ourselves around hazards as best we can. So today, we're going to try to do our best to educate you uh, as best we can. So really what we need to start with is defining what heat stress actually is. It starts with understanding the way your body works. Your body wants to maintain a nice even level. It doesn't like peaks and valleys. Eat too much sugar, you sugar spike, you sugar crash. Eat too much fatty foods, you're going to obviously gain weight more than what the body actually wants to have. Temperature is just like that. Your body wants to maintain a temperature of 98.6 degrees. The body does that three ways. It does that by circulating the blood to the extremities of the body. The core is going to be maintaining the heat of your body. It uses these as basically conduits to sweat and evaporate to cool off that blood flow from the core to try to circulate that back in to regulate that temperature. By doing that on its natural self, if we're in an environment that, to its own devices, if the body can stay at 98.6, we're good. But unfortunately, much of us, if it's either weather related or the indoor pieces like we just talked about, sometimes you get put into a situation where those alone will not keep your body regulated. Heat stress itself starts when the body hits about 99.7. That's when you're basically starting to get a fever. Uh, throughout the progression of the heat stress symptoms, however, though, it will basically range between 99.7 all the way to about 104 degrees. Once your internal temperature hits 104 degrees, some really bad stuff starts happening. But fortunately, throughout that span of temperature, your body is going to give you warning signs to be able to try to take action to mitigate against those risks. Stats on this though, we've got basically the, the earliest stats I have are from 2014. Close to 2,700 people had succumbed to injury due to heat related illness. And we had 18 deaths. Obviously one death and one uh, injury related illness is far too much. So today and hopefully the information we share today will hopefully try to get those down to zero. So the progression of heat related illness. As I said, between 99.7 and 104, these are what you're going to start to get. So I'm all going to start out with heat rash. What is heat rash? Well, as we talked about, the body wants to regulate its temperature. It does that naturally. It starts to sweat so that it evaporates, cools the body down. Well, if it's in an overly heat present environment, it's going to excessively sweat. And by doing that, it gets trapped underneath the skin. It can't come out fast enough starts to feel tingly, a little itchy, start to get a little red bumps. I'm sure we've all felt this at some point. Typically it goes away on its own, but if it lasts and it continues on, really try to get yourself into a little bit cooler environment, try to cool the skin down, maybe dump a little water, ice pack or something, try to get that down. But that's kind of your first indicator that mm, I might be getting a little bit warm out here. If we don't really heed our body's warnings when it comes to heat rash, we move on to heat cramps. I've got these, I get them in my calves. Uh, some people will have them locate in different areas, but the causes are exactly the same. It's working in hot environments, not taking in enough hydration, proper hydration of water, salts, and electrolytes, and heavy sweating. Oftentimes though, a heat, cram or a heat cramp is extremely painful, but acute typically goes away on its own. But the more critical portion of this is involuntary muscle spasms. If we're working in an environment and we have to utilize fine motor skills to make minute adjustments on pieces that might have adverse effects on either a piece of equipment or ourselves, that could come into play and cause an even greater issue. So treatment for this really is to, again, get yourself into a cool, ventilated area and hydration is key. So hydration meaning replacing those salts, 
electrolytes and water by hopefully getting a sports drink or some kind of supplement within that. We'll get more into those a little later on. Uh, if these don't go away though, and you're starting to really be impeded, try to seek medical help. It's okay. But again, this is kind of early on stages of, all right, I need to get my temp down. But say we've been out on the job uh, it's a good 10 minute walk to an area where I could cool myself down and you know what, I've only got five minutes left in this project, I'm just gonna push through. Well, if you've ignored those first two signs from your body, you might progress to heat exhaustion. It's the same causes, heavy sweating, working in those really hot environments. By this point though, there's a point I really wanna highlight. You're gonna continue to heavily sweat, you're gonna start to feel fatigued, you're gonna to start to get some more cramping, but the big one is this. This is the first point you are going to feel thirsty. We're at the third step, knocking on heat stroke's door. By the time you're thirsty, it's too late to start to hydrate. Get off this, this is your final indicator to get into a cool environment and restore hydration. If you don't, you could start to get a headache, start to become dizzy, disoriented, nauseous, or even start to vomit. So without regulating this and heating again, get into the cool environment and restoring the electrolyte salt hydration, massage out those cramps, you may wanna seek medical attention. So same example, we're at that site that's a little too far away from our ability to get to a nice cool place. We finished that job, yes, we got it done, but, we've progressed into heat stroke because we pushed our body too far and our core temperature now is at 104 or above. By that point, you are gonna really be breaking down. Your body is thinking, I have something inside of me that is causing my body to break down and I'm gonna go into sustain mode. All the blood is gonna start rushing into the center of the body. It's gonna have rapid breathing. Your blood circulation and blood pressure are going to rise. And what it's also gonna do is it's gonna make you nauseous. You might barf because why? Well, it thinks there's a foreign body in you, something causing this. Let's get everything out and only sustain the core organ groups that you have. This is gonna cause disorientation. It's gonna cause confusion. You're not gonna be able to move yourself correctly. If this starts to happen, or you have any signs of this, or you notice any one of your coworkers having this, you need to immediately call 911. This is very stressful on the body. This can cause heart attacks, this can cause stroke, or it's in and of itself, it can actually boil the inside of the body. Those organs are not meant to go above 104 and you can have long lasting damage past that. So call 911 from there. Move that person to a cool, ventilated environment start excessive cooling techniques. The hottest areas, back of the neck, armpits, groin, start putting ice packs there, buckets of cold water. But the key portion of this is if any one of your fellow employees succumbs to heat stroke, do not give them anything to eat or drink. Why? As we just said, the body thinks there's something wrong. There's something inside that we need to get out. If you introduce anything more to that body, it's just going to expel it, make you more dehydrated and that's just going to further compound the issues. So wait until things start to stabilize again to then start reintroducing hydration or let the medical professionals do it via IV. So who's at risk? As we said, anybody working outside obviously in the hump summer months is very much at risk. You, you cannot get rid of heat. It's there. It's what the weather is. But a lot of you guys as well, indoor work, even in the winter times, depending on the machinery and the type of uh, area that you're in, if it's well ventilated or if the machinery gives off a lot of heat, you could very well be at risk even on the coldest days. So big piece of risk awareness on this is never think that you're gonna lose pay, that you're too busy, too weak, or it's too far to go to the bathroom. Why? A, it's gonna cost you a hell of a lot more than any potential docked pay, which you won't get, because legally, Hoosier couldn't dock you pay off of that. It's gonna cost you a hell of a lot more in medical bills than a couple minutes of docked pay. Second piece, I'm too busy for it. I got five minutes left on this project, I'm almost done. Well, two and a half minutes in, you succumb to heat stroke. Well, that five minutes just turned into five days because you had to go to the hospital and had to recover. Listen to what your body says 
Remember those steps, remember those symptoms, and heed those warnings. So potential risk factors that can contribute into heat stress along from just heat itself. Your age and weight, obviously we cannot do anything about age that ever marches on, but obviously the less you weigh, the less your body has to regulate. Medications and medical conditions can obviously compound this. Uh, certain conditions can give higher blood pressure, higher strain and just the body living itself. You get into one of these high shock environments, it can really compound. Alcohol is a particular kicker. Night before, you know, any, any alcohol consumption really it thins the blood out, prevents it from circulating the blood as effectively as possible, which again is our main conduit for regulating our temperature, as well as dehydrates the body. Those are two of the worst things that you can do uh, when it comes to heat stress. So as good as it sounds to have a nice cold beer mowing the lawn, it's probably not a great idea. Uh, body physical exhaustion and PPE, those are things that uh, we'll get into in a little bit, but kind of a cool one, or not a cool one, but one that people don't often think about is the body's adjustment time. For now, we're at the end of summer. Everybody's pretty much adjusted to the summer temps as we are, but Say you have new employees joining who are gonna be in a lot of these hot indoor environments. The body takes about four to six days to get used to an environment. You think at the beginning of every season of summer, 78 degrees feels really hot because we just caught off of 20s and 30s. Well, by this time of year, 78, 75 is a relief over the mid 80s to 90 degree. But it takes that body a couple of days, so be aware of that. Don't overexert yourself. So the OSHA general duty clause states to furnish each of his employees employment and place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death, serious physical harm to his employees. This hazard is obviously heat. It's one that can't be completely engineered away. So how do we deal with it? We know how we feel and we know what we need to do to our bodies once we feel the effects, but how do we currently manage? So. A wise man, and again, you could argue if Nelly is a truly wise man, he said take off all your clothes when you get too hot, but HR might be in the room. I don't recommend that. What we do, like any hazard, is a four-step process. Eliminate it as best you can. We can't. It's present. It will always be there. So we need to engineer around it, administratively put programs into place, and then adjust our PPE as necessary to best mitigate against its risks. Engineering. We're going to try to provide air-conditioned, well-ventilated areas, break stations, cooling spots. When you're outdoor environments, that might be setting up tents, might be setting up a single umbrella over somebody who might not be moving for a long time. Indoors, ventilate as much as possible or set up designated cooling spaces. By engineering these components into here, you give yourselves that out so you don't find yourself in that environment of, oh man, I'm about to stroke out, I better get somewhere. You at least have somewhere to go. By that point though, obviously can't control every single portion and eliminate every piece of that hazard. So we move on to the administrative pieces. It's what we're doing right now. And there's a lot involved within that. Uh, this is all education for you. It's what you do with this education and holding yourselves accountable. But one of the big pieces of education on this that I like to really point out is hydration. Most of us think water alone is going to be able to, uh, to help us stay in that homeostasis level that we want to be at. But we found that about 78% of the workers that suffered from heat stress were also heavily dehydrated. That's something that we need to learn to manage every single day. How do we manage our hydration? Door P, this handy little chart here is what you need to be able to utilize to make sure that your body is ready to be able to enter and to operate effectively in a hot environment. Now again, hydration is not just water. It's water, it's salt, and it's electrolytes. Why? Salt and electrolytes allow you to retain that water and the electrolytes allow your body to actually utilize that water. If you're only bringing water in, you're just flushing it straight back out, and it's actually gonna take more of your, your uh, internal minerals out of your body, and it's just gonna exacerbate the effects. How do we do that? You do that through things like a squincher, through Gatorades. Try to get it sugar-free. 
sugars are only going to spike our heart rates up. It's going to exhaust us even more. So try to get a sugar-free supplement of some kind. But hydration. If you've got a frothy double IPA coming out, you're really, really dehydrated and you need to start hydrating immediately. If you're peeing out straight clear water, again, not enough electrolyte, not enough sodium within there. You want to have a slightly yellowy tinted urine. The big piece of this though is I do not want to be getting to this level halfway through my shift. Don't show up to work in this, in this range here. You're not going to be able to get yourself to the nicely hydrated area if you're coming into a heavily exhaustive work environment. What does that mean? Well, it means to be hydrating basically 24-7. Constantly keep those good fluids, those electrolytes, those sodiums going into your body so that you can come well hydrated and maintain this stasis rather than working off of the back foot to get back there. I'm here to tell you, you can't. So, as we talked about, get yourself some kind of supplement of some sorts. Again, they can be pre-mixed, they can be the little sticks that you mix into the water bottles that you carry yourselves. They sell the lovely freeze pops that have all the electrolytes and sodiums that you can need in there that are also going to cool the core down. Uh, but have that on hand so that you can make sure to hydrate properly. One of the other things though that I get a lot of uh, not really backlash, but a lot of people question is, well, how can I have to work with both hands all day? I can't have a big bulky water bottle on me constantly sipping off this thing while I'm working on a project. Fine. Get a hydration pack. Throw three liters on your back, have it right here and just be able to bite off of a little straw to be able to keep that hydration with you at all times. It's a very simple way to keep you fully engaged and fully active and fully hydrated throughout the day. OSHA did come out with their rest water shade campaign. I would like to update that to rest hydrate shade. Again, water itself is not going to do the body what it actually needs to be able to mitigate against actual heat exhaustion. So education like we are right now, awareness is key, but guys, you gotta hold these, each other accountable for this. Watch your fellow man. Don't be embarrassed to call people out on things and to, to really champion a, uh, a program to mitigate against heat stress. Finally, PPE. PPE, there's a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts. For us, we gotta wear FR. A lot of FR gear in here and it is not breathable. Well, what do we wanna do? We wanna have multi-climate work where that helps transport moisture, accelerate evaporation, keep you cool, basically breathable. Well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of great options for that. The best we have found is the IQ series of clothing from Bulwark. Um, this polo here is that. It's about as close as you're gonna get to a nice Saturday, Sunday golf polo. Uh, but the critical portion of this is trying to get that moisture off the body. Trapping moisture does two things. In a hot environment, it acts like a sauna, traps it in, keeps that temperature going up and up and up. We don't want that. But also, as we approach these cooler months, say you're working inside or even outside and you're really exerting yourself, trapping that moisture is also going to expose you to a much greater risk of initial heat exhaustion, but then potential for hypothermia in those really cold times. So evaporation is critical. Wearing light colored clothing to reduce and reduce sun exposure. This would be a terrible outfit for a 90 degree day outside all day. This shirt would be much better. I get much less UV exposure by having all of my skin actually covered. It's loose fitting so I will have circulation within it and a light color to not absorb the UV rays. Obviously, if we can't cover that skin, get some kind of UV protection of hopefully SPF 50 or better. I know they handed some of it out at the beginning of this, this program here. So. Obviously the don'ts are the exact opposite of that. Dark colors, don't want that. Tight fitting clothing, again, no evaporation, no circulation. And polyester, basically like wearing a trash bag. It's just gonna trap all that moisture in you, you don't want that. So 
final bit on PPE is if those simple measures of just your existing PPE do not cover and do not prevent you from being exposed to that uh, effects of heat stress, there are further measures. You guys all got do-rags, which have a cooling evaporative piece within that. Uh, these are all active cooling pieces of technology here. So you got a version of this headband. They sell hard hat covers, necks, uh, necks towels, hats, and the most extreme for those that are really out and have no way of getting out of the exposure, you can get cooling vests, either evaporative or active cooling, which will keep that core nice and chilly. So again, there's really no excuse to not have a way to be unexposed from, from heat stress. So the main por portion of why we are even talking about this is on the back of these two gentlemen's shirts is we want to go home the same way we came to work. It's what Hoosier wants, it's what all your fellow employees want, it's especially what your family wants. So while this seems mundane and we might have heard of this quite a bit, these are the fundamentals. We pick up on things uh, the more time we get exposed to them. Michael Jordan shot free throws up until the day he retired. It was the most boring fundamental thing that he could do, but that's why he was the best. And that is one of the, it's what's going to keep you guys from being exposed to heat stress. So final bit on say four is use this training in your personal lives. The other piece that could affect your family is your ability not to be able to come into work because you succumbed to heat stress related illness, mowing the lawn, doing another uh, sporting activity outside of work, gardening, any of those pieces. So keep this knowledge top of mind because it affects your life 24-7. Uh, so heat stress rough, I like dogs, so that's why we went with the, the wonderful heat stress is rough pun. But uh, that being said, I hope you are all at least educated again on the symptoms to watch out for, what to do about them when you do feel them coming on, and the four steps to hopefully try to eliminate this hazard as best you possibly can. With that, I do have some handouts. Uh, I've got our summer catalog, which has basically a full line of products that match exactly what we were talking about. Hard hat stickers, stress relief balls. I've got three buffaloes, if anybody's kids want them, and one t-shirt. So any questions, I'd happily field them now, or if you want to ask me something later after the, our uh, presentation, be happy to take that too. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it.